reinvention. The act of transitioning from one identity to another is something we will all experience at least once, if not many times throughout our lives. I grew up doing both rhythmic gymnastics, which is the one with the ribbon and the balls, and this is me, pictured at 19 years old, and ballet. And this is a picture of me at 25 years old with the Boston Ballet. To be clear, no. I can't do either of these things at this level anymore. And no, doing both at the same time was not the norm. I started ballet at the age of three and gymnastics at the age of five and was very quickly swept onto a track where everything in my life became secondary to the pursuit of these two careers. I went through my high school years straddling these two distinct worlds and without explicitly knowing it then, bringing skills from one into the other. In the gymnastics world, I was known as a balletic gymnast. And in the ballet world, I was known as a dynamic and athletic ballerina. And it wasn't easy growing up, trying to have a normal social life and juggle academics while training multiple hours a day, traveling the country and the world for competitions and training with the top coach. And I came very close to quitting many, many times. You can just ask my parents. But from where I stand now, moving from gymnastics to ballet to business, I wouldn't trade my experience growing up for anything. Over the years, I've experienced three major transitions, and I've learned that the true art of reinvention is a muscle to develop. It is a practice that lies not in becoming something or someone different, but in exploring and expanding more of who you are. It is a process built on the shoulders of past identities and the unique lessons you've learned along the way. It is my challenge to you to think about change as an opportunity for exploration and expansion, as opposed to focusing on the feelings of pain, loss, and fear that we often feel at the outset. I have been fascinated with this concept of reinvention since the early years of my gymnastics career. You see, athletes, gymnasts, dancers, we grew up in dog years, and we know that our reinvention will come much sooner than the average professional. As a gymnast, at the age of 14, I competed in world championships in Budapest, and then I competed in World Cups and Grand Prix in Moscow, Israel, Japan. And so by the time I turned 17, I was considered a mature gymnast. And looking at this photo of my sister Rosie and I, also a gymnast, you can see why we don't push well past the age of 20. It's really, really hard on the body. I finished my career ranked number two in Canada, and with my timing for the Olympics being off, I decided it was time to transition into the world of ballet. When I transitioned into the world of dancing, I jumped from one realm of dog years into another with a slightly longer runway. In the US, most classical ballet dancers reach around the age of 30. And if you make it to the age of 30 as a professional ballerina, that's pretty darn good in my book. I imagined that I would dance well into my 30s. Instead, I enjoyed a decade-long career with Boston Ballet, dancing iconic roles like the Arabian Princess in The Nutcracker and fierce female roles like this one in Yorma Ello's Lost on Slow. At the age of 27, a devastating injury to my ankle became chronic and it cut my time on stage short. While it was scary and jarring to move from being a gymnast to being a ballet dancer, that decision was my choice. It was something I wanted. When it came time for me to hang up my point shoes, to transition entirely away from ballet 10 years later, I wasn't the one to call the shot. And I will always remember the day in 2016 when the artistic director, Miko Nisanen, asked me into his office. I walked in. The smell of rich leather filled my nose, and there are amazing, epic shots of some of the most iconic moments in ballet all over the office, some of which I've danced myself. Miko welcomes me in. I sit. Rachel, how are you doing? 
At this point, I'm hoping to give a positive progress report. Things have finally turned a corner. The latest round of injections seems to have worked, and I think I'll be back on stage soon. But when I open my mouth, I have to say the truth. Things are not going well. I'm in a lot of pain, and nothing seems to be working, and I feel like I've been trying everything. But I'm confident that it'll just take a few more tries, maybe a few more weeks, and then I'll be back in the studio. And when I lift my eyes to meet Miko's, his are shining with tears, something I've never in all of the 10 years working with him seen. Rachel, I can't offer you a contract for next season. You have one body, and I cannot responsibly ask you to continue to push yourself in this way. Hearing the words that I have feared for three years hits me like a ton of bricks. The floor opens up in front of me and I'm falling, and yet I surprise even myself when I say, thank you. Thank you for doing what I could not. And in that moment, I was in shock. Everything I'd sacrificed somehow gone in a second. And then the next year I went through this crazy narrative of a breakup, the honeymoon phase, where, wow, I should have done this years ago. What freedom to denial. Maybe it's not really over. Maybe I didn't try everything to a full-on existential crisis. Who am I? What am I? If not a dancer, then what? And it was really strange to me because I knew this reinvention was coming. Every dancer will have to hang up their point shoes at some point. And I had even planned for this. I had a college degree, I had a network, contacts, but I had zero idea of where I was going next or how I would possibly fit in to this new world. And in those moments, I wondered if everything I had sacrificed was worth this. Letting everything go for a while seemed like the only way forward. I wasn't going to dance my way into my next job. And if I wasn't going to dance at the highest level, well, I wasn't gonna dance at all. At the same time, I was convinced that I still had more to share through my dancing. Interviewing as a former professional ballet dancer with zero office experience is a hoot. The number of companies who could not see the value of having a tall swan or a fierce female dancer in their midst was, well, not surprising. I remember one fine institution in Boston said, hmm, well, we don't dance here. And that was not untrue. The first nine to five that I landed was as a development assistant in the fundraising offices of Harvard University. Talk about a change of scenery. And I will leave the feeling of moving from dancing in a 2,600 seat theater to being in a literal cubicle for another time. Within the first two weeks of my time as a development associate at Harvard, I started to pick up on this dancer spidey sense that maybe the values I'd embodied and the skills I'd honed were actually of value in this non-physical arena. I remember looking around and observing that this meeting could be made so much more effective and dynamic if we put in some rehearsal techniques, or this presentation that I was watching could be made so much more engaging for the audience and more enjoyable for the presenter with some professional performance technique to help perform under pressure. What if my past was still relevant in this new world? What if it isn't about the dancing, but about the ability to articulately read an audience or holistically communicate a message and perform with ease under pressure? I wondered what other businesses might find these skills valuable. On this hunch, and after having many conversations with friends just to make sure I wasn't going crazy, I founded Choreography for Business. I started training people in the restaurant industry, how to move in awkward spaces with grace and deliver high-level service with 
body language and presence. And then I moved these concepts into other industries, training aspiring young female leaders, executives, consultants, sales teams. I was beginning to see that it was in leaving the confines of the opera house stage that allowed me to unlock a deeper impact on the world and people around me. No one told me that my ballet experience would be so valuable. In the ballet world, in fact, the general consensus is your dancing years are your best years, which automatically assumes that once you're no longer dancing, your best years are behind you. Outside of the ballet world, I was able to reframe my experience and shed a completely different perspective into other industries and professions. I was able to explore and expand more, more of who I was, bringing my life to a higher level. And I definitely had my doubts, and I still do. But I also had these moments of clarity. One such moment was when I was coaching a client who is congenitally blind, which means he's never seen a moving human body before. I was working with him on his TEDx and building a physical framework around memories he'd lived out. Memories of coming home and finding a big box of Lego and sifting through a big braille binder, creating 3D Lego shapes with his hands, things he would never see but could feel. And as I watched him perform his TEDx talk, I realized this is the power of bringing the ballet out of the opera house and working with individuals on their physicality. So what's in this for you? You might not be a dancer, but maybe you're an athlete or an aspiring or already dedicated professional. Maybe you're in the throes of transition right now. We all, at some point in our lives, will have an identity taken away from us. Maybe it's the identity of a role, a responsibility, a passion, or a direction. In early 2020, we were all invited to reinvent ourselves. Overnight, our country and our world was thrown into a different dimension, and we all had to face a common enemy. What do you do if a job or an entire industry disappears overnight? Early in 2020, I can speak for myself, I found myself yet again in a position of having everything that I'd worked towards and everything that I was really beginning to love be impossible. Elevating the human experience, communicating in person. And like many of you, I spent a while fretting and wondering, like, how could it be that I am back in this position? And then I took a deep breath. And I realized, I've been here before. This feels familiar. And this time, I knew what to look for. In the exact same way that dancers build muscle memory around intricate and complicated choreography that at first glance seems impossible, my muscles of reinvention kicked into high gear. I thought of the values that I have and still hold dear, connection, communication, performance, were those no longer relevant? It took another reframe for me to see that while in-person gatherings and conversations had been outlawed, they had not disappeared. They had simply moved into a new virtual and remote setting. And an entire language was bestowed upon our world. And people were gonna need help figuring out how to engage and interact with this two-dimensional audience. Again, the art of reinvention does not mean you throw away your past skills, your past experience, your past self. It is about reframing and applying a different perspective to a part of the world that might have been waiting for you all along. And it takes practice. As we all face the uncertainty of a chaotic world, what do you value and treasure? Is there some unique perspective or experience that you have that could be exactly what someone else is looking for? What if our best years are still to come? As for myself, I know I will be reinventing myself again. 
as much as I would love to say, finally, here I am, made it through my transition. Now I am firmly a fill in the blank. This is a lie. This is a lie. And in thinking this way, we handcuff ourselves to a fraction of what is possible. Our world demands that we think creatively and collaboratively. Our world demands that we collectively reinvent the way we consume, the way we create. What is the world missing? It could be a future you.